Day 14. Time, approximately 6 a.m. Location, the Big 52, Memorial, South Branch. Mr. White stepped into the shack and looked over at Long Ears, who was sitting in the middle of a circle made of some small bones, long glass beads, and other weird stuff, with her horn glowing like a neon lamp. The mare sat in the usual, unusual posture. She had her hind legs crossed, and her front hooves looked like a blossoming flower. She was... weird. And somehow the stallion couldn't help but wonder if the farseer wasn't actually a zebra, despite all the evidence to the contrary. On the other side of the room, Sage was packing the last of their weapons, and was almost ready to leave for the ironworks. White's nephew simply ignored Long Ears and went about his work, slowly and with his usual attention to detail. Okay, I'll take the bait. What is she doing? The White Apple's leader looked at the Farseer with a puzzled expression. Sagebrush shrugged. I have no idea. She said she was going to perform a ritual that would sink our enemies in the fog of war, then took a shitload of chems and has been doing that ohm thing since then. Chems? Mike frowned. There was a strong scent of burning herbs in the room, and that low chant was starting to unsettle him. And the whole atmosphere seemed odd, somehow wrong, but he couldn't quite put his hoof on why exactly. Oh, like mintals, a lot. Then some white candies I've never seen, and a lot of green stuff. Smoked some stuff, gulped down all the rest. Oh, and she drank a lot. And when I see a lot, I mean a lot. And then she went like that. All mystical and stuff. Small shiny dots flickered the edges of White's vision, like little ghostly fireflies, making his peripheral vision blurry. The smoke smell was stronger in the middle of the room. He wondered if the whole scene was actually in front of him, or if it was just a dream he was having. The stallion shook his head. No, it was just that smoke. The chems could have that effect, giving you a better grasp on the magical fluxes, but cutting your perception of reality. This kind of stuff was very, very addictive. He had to fight back that tingling sensation to stay focused on the real stuff. Did you mention some sort of mist? Sage nodded. Exactly. She blabbered about this fog of war, then stopped talking at all. The white stallion tapped his chin, thoughtfully. A fog of war. Like, tossing a cloud on their heads. Why didn't seem very enthusiastic. Go figure. The sniper finished packing the weapons on his back. He didn't seem to be affected at all by the smoke, but Sage's body was stronger and he could probably shrug off that sort of thing more easily. But if she doesn't wake up soon, we're leaving her here. Not that I'll miss her anyway. The older frown stallion frowned. Hey, never underestimate an ally. She can save your sorry ass. It was easy to see with just a glance that the unicorn mare wasn't a common pony. Still, White knew that trying to explain something like that to his nephew was a waste of time. Um... Sage snickered. Like foretelling from where I'll get shot today? Yep, a total loss of good time. Like taking a bullet or two in your place. White sighed and turned to leave. Let's get out of here, Slowpoke. The stench of the shack is overbearing. Day 14. Time. Approximately 6.30 a.m. Location. Ironworks. Big 52, South Branch. So, this is that famed ghost every pony's been talking about these last couple of days. The red unicorn, Stallion, with an even redder mane, looked down at Puppy Smiles. I'm not impressed. Slackblade snickered. You will be. This thing seems to be near unstoppable, and she knows how to repair radio machines and stuff. The Red Stallion still didn't seem very interested. Alright, so you want a pet? The pony shrugged. Help yourself. See if I care. 
Now get out of my sight and make yourself useful, like... Take some tools and go downstairs and help the guys at the stable door. Easy peasy. Slash turned towards his crew. You heard him. Let's go crack that nut and get the prize inside. He poked Puppy's flank before trotting away. You too. Come on, ghost. Puppy was having a bad time. She'd gotten spanked and scolded, and even if the spanking didn't actually hurt, she was very, very wounded on the inside. Usually Mom scolded her a little, and once she even spanked her too. But when Puppy said she was sorry, Mom immediately hugged her and they made peace. These ponies on the other hoof simply laughed and made her feel bad. No pony came to nudge her or to tell her that everything was alright. She needed to show how good she was, so they could look at her again like that time when she repaired the radio. The filly was interrupted by Plastic Flower calling for her before leaving the leader's tent. So ya coming or not, Slowpoke? Yeah, I'm coming. Puppy's weak reply was accompanied by a long sigh. Then the fold trudged along behind the group. When Bloodbath was alone again, he went back to his table and examined the map. His eyes traced the red circle that ringed Dyron Works and jumped between the crosses that marked the surrounding routes and smaller settlements. He allowed himself to smile. The long-range patrols didn't find any resistance around the city. The reports talked about hastily abandoned shacks and deserted roads all around the memorial. This was going to be easy. The only thing that bothered the raider was that cemetery marked as Ghost Hill. It was where Lucky's group was headed before they lost contact. And those idiots in Red Roach Team didn't find a single clue about where the tank had gone. Coming back instead with a stupid foal in a hazmat suit. The ghost of the Big 52. Well, if she really was that hero, she didn't seem like such a threat. And even better, she was now the mascot for the worst team in the herd. Big 52's dwellers should have chosen their heroes a little better. Bloodbath's train of thought was interrupted when a sprite bot floated into his tent. He scowled at the unwanted visitor. What is it now? When the sprite bot spoke, it was Solus's voice. Bloodbath, we might have a problem. Cutting through the door with our equipment will take a lot of time. I strongly advise ignoring it and moving north as soon as possible before the enemy organizes their defense. Bloodbath laughed. It's a bit too late for that. No, weird talking bowl. We'll have our fun here, and the legend of our crew will grow. In the end, every pony in the Big 52 will cower at our approach. The walls around them crumbling to dust before the terror we bring. They won't even try to fight back. They'll run. Because you can shield yourself from bullets, but you can't save yourself from your fears. Solus fell silent before replying. Mind control is cleaner and more efficient. Wasting too much horsepower is inefficient, with no guarantee of obtaining the desired effect. I should look into finding a better solution. The stallion walked towards the sprite bot, his face bunched up in anger. Now listen to me, you pitiful machine. You gave us weapons and robots, but you are not the boss. I am the leader of the wild herd, and I am allowing you to be part of the winning team until we're done. When we have finished with the Big 52, you'll have plenty of space to start rebuilding, and you'll have slaves and construction material and everything else. But not from these ponies. We buy slaves from the outside. There'll be plenty of caps for that. But these ones, they die. Every. Single. Pony. I don't want history to come back and bite me on the tail. Solus was silent for a full minute before replying again. This collaboration is not proceeding as intended. You are changing the terms. I shall retire the robots. Or maybe I should look for a better partner. Bloodbath snorted. You think you can blackmail me? I have enough tanks and heavy weapons. I don't care if your useless tin cans go anywhere. The stallion bucked a crate making it fly across the tent and smash into a pile of ammo boxes. Very well. The sprite bot turned around and started to go away. Wait, you fucker! All right, you win. 
Go downstairs and tell the ponies at the stable door to only kill the ones that fight back. The ones that surrender will be taken prisoner. The red pony spat on the ground. We can execute them in front of their friends later. Anyway. The sprite bot seemed to nod slightly. Very well. You are a reasonable pony. I shall go. With those words, the robot floated away towards the camp. Scarcely illuminated by the first light of morning, which struggled to be seen through a heavy bank of fog. As the drone was leaving, another pony entered the tent. Hey, boss. There's a thick fog coming from the hills. I'm no unicorn, but it stinks of magic, <coughs> and it's already gotten into the camp. Bloodbath laughed. Those fuckers. Do they really think they can take us by surprise with such a cheap trick? I knew they were stupid, but I didn't think they had completely lost their minds. The unicorn abruptly stopped, laughing and poked his head outside the tent, checking the weather. All right. Put every pony with a pit buck on sentinel duty. Give them assault rifles and some extra mintals. The new arrival nodded. I'm on it. He galloped out of the tent. Somewhere in the mist, still more than a kilometer away from the city, three yellow figures trotted the same trail Puppy had followed earlier that day. The lead figure perfectly stepping in her hoof prints as they went. Day 14. Time approximately 7.30 a.m. Location Ironworks, Big 52, South Branch. Slashblade neighed, bucking the humongous round door. What the fuck? This chunk of scrap will never come down! A gong-like sound echoed in the large room for several seconds, while the stallion jumped all around the floor in pain. Kicking open huge anti-megaspell door test, failed. A large variety of tools and weapons littered the stable's atrium floor, while the whole red roach team tried to pierce the thick metal with a plasma cutter. So far, they had only managed to carve a list of vulgarities on the door's surface, but they couldn't get past the third layer of thermal shielding. Unlike the raiders, who were mostly swearing and kicking things, Puppy was having a great time. That crazy spanker was nowhere to be seen, and this place was full of big toys. She had already played hide-and-seek for a bit, and won every prize she could think of like best seeker, best hider, cutest participant and such, mostly because no one cared about where she was hiding. But this didn't mean she wasn't good at the game. To celebrate her victory, the foal had her best tea party ever, with an arc welder and a couple of pneumatic hammers. After she finished playing, she turned her attention to the giant door on the council, sitting on its side. Why are you bullying the door? The filly tried, uh, sniffing a newly made and still smoking cut in the metal, but her helmet got in the way. We're not bullying the door, you idiot. We need it open. The puppy sat down. Why? Do you want to play with the pretty ponies inside? Stinky Tail laughed loudly. Yeah, you could say that. Puppy looked at the door, then the console, and again at the door. This was her chance to get some respect back from these ponies. They've been treating her like a stupid fool since the spanking. Ah, uh, maybe I know how to open it? Every pony in the room stopped and turned towards Puppy Smiles. It was Slash that interrupted the silence. Are you kidding? You can open this thing? Yeah, it's easy. I just need to tell the magic voice, the identification cow, and the, uh, the, the passcode, and the big door will open. The stallion tilted his head, a bit confused. And you know the code? Of course I know the code, duh. Who doesn't? Puppy shook her head slightly. Here, let me show ya. The filly in yellow trotted to the console and put a hoof on the green button. But when the automated voice started speaking, there were only fizzles and buzzes. The full look of the console, a bit stumped. Ah, it shouldn't do this. Papercut coughed. Eh, maybe we went a little medieval on the thing. Actually, it could be broken. The frown in Puppy's muzzle became a smile. Broken? Don't worry, I can fix it. Day 14. Time approximately 8 a.m. Location, Ironworks, Big 52, South Branch. The raider yawned, staring in front of her at the EFS, looking for any red dots that might appear. Nothing, nothing, still nothing. Fuck, 
Miss Fog. I want to get back to looting the shops. The other unicorn guard hit her companion on the head with a hoof. Shut up. Keep an eye on the fucking censors. I'd rather not get ambushed just because you ditched guard duty. Fuck off. The mirror with the pit buck sighed and turned again towards the wall of fog. It was an unnatural, and she could tell it because it gave her false contacts on the censors. Flashes of yellow and red that would vanish the moment she tried to focus on them. This fog's creepy. Like a ghost could just appear in front of you and... A red dot appeared, followed by another two. The guard readied her rifle and pointed it towards the enemies, tapping her hoof on the ground three times. The second guard nodded and readied her assault rifle too. The dots weren't moving very much. They didn't produce any audible sound, but since they appeared only a few seconds ago, the enemy should still be far away. The guard tapped her hoof on the ground. Tap. Both mares readied their rifle. Tap. Both mares looked through the sights. This far from the camp, the sounds of the other raiders came muffled, and in the pauses between one pony yelling and another laughing, the guards could hear two more pairs of hooves trotting very near. Too near. Fuck! Shoot! Both rifles opened fire, showering the place where the enemy should have been with a storm of bullets. There was a sound very similar to a shriek that echoed in the fog. Then the three dots disappeared and the weapons stopped firing. What the fuck was that? The guard was interrupted by her portable radio activating. Advanced position, butterfly. I heard shots coming from your direction. What's going on? There were some sneaky bastards trying to catch us by surprise, but we got them. We're moving to see what those fuckers were. While the guard with the pit buck talked on the radio, the second guard left her position and moved into the fog, heading towards the point where the red dots disappeared. All right, call us as soon as you find anything out, replied the radio before going mute. Hey, did you hear that bad muffin? Take a look and come back fast. They shouldn't have been far. Hey, Bat. I think we killed the roach's mascot. From her voice, Muffin didn't sound like she went deep inside the fog. Nailed back, could almost imagine seeing her silhouette in the white haze. Wait. There's another identical fool here. What the fuck's going on? I don't know. Drag her here so we can have a better look. Bat was following her companion on the compass, keeping an eye on her yellow dot. Then suddenly, three red dots appeared again all around her. Muffin, come back, it's a trap! What the? Hey, let me go! There was a scream of pain and the yellow dot disappeared almost instantly. Her telekinetic field, shaking, nailed Bat, aimed for the red dots and pulled the trigger. The sound of her empty rifle served as a dreadful reminder that she hadn't reloaded. Oh fuck, oh fuck! Mare desperately tried to change the rifle's magazine. She detached the old one using her magic, then something soft and squishy hit her on the muzzle. The little pony backpedaled, trying her best to dodge an incoming attack, and noticed it was a severed leg lying in front of her. It was Muffin's leg. And it had been ripped away with brute force. Nailed Bat suddenly succeeded in reloading the rifle and rented it in front of her, looking at the red dots, but they just disappeared. Where the... thump? Something landed on her back. The raider jumped and started running in a desperate attempt to shake off her assailant. But soon the mare felt a couple of hooves grab her neck. In horror, she lowered her eyes, only to see a pair of yellow plastic hooves for a moment before her head was ripped away from her body. Day 14. Time. Approximately 8 a.m. Location. Ironworks. Big 52, South Branch. Puppy's rump swung left and right as it stuck out of the stable door's control panel. The filly had been hard at work, hitting vital components and ripping away cables for a good half an hour at this point, as the red team was beginning to suspect that she hadn't the slightest idea of what she was doing. Almost there, done here. Puppy's report on the repairs was followed by a hoofful of electronic parts flying across the room. I just need to give this thing another couple bucks and it should look like a teapot. Like a what now? Collateral damage approached the foal with a doubtful expression. I'm not sure you can fix anything by taking parts out of it. Ah, don't worry. I've seen my mom doing this kind of stuff a lot of times. It's just a matter of how hard you kick it. Closed. Really? 
Poppy hit the console repeatedly with her faithful stone. Fuck. This is getting us nowhere. Slash Blade snapped. That door won't cut itself! The ponies grumbled and complained as they went back to their work. Poppy popped her head out of the control and whined. No, wait. Give me another chance. I can fix it. Honest. Puppy bucked the console one last time with all the strength she had. The console screen lit up in an angry crimson glare. Warning! Warning! Security compromised! The whole atrium was flooded with red flashing lights. The raiders hurriedly gathered in the middle of the large room, into a mockery of a defensive formation with their weapons trained outwards, covering each other's blind spots. Purging area! Several trapdoors popped open from the floor, and four spheres mounted on short props sprang out of them. The room filled with a low hum as blue energy crackled across the spheres and jumped between the coils beneath them. Slash Blade opened fire at one of the devices, but his light caliber bullets were deflected by the curved metallic structure of the sphere. The Red Roach leader turned towards Puppy, with an exasperated look of desperation and anger on his face. What did you do, you idiot? You killed us all! Curse you! Zap! A powerful discharge of electricity swept through the room, arcing from sphere to sphere, all along the floor and the walls. It lasted less than a second. When the lightning disappeared, all that remained of the raiders was a pile of smoking charred corpses, and a pretty untouched puppy smiles. Wearing a fully insulated suit can sometimes come in handy. Day 14. Time approximately 8.30 a.m. Location Ironworks, Big 52, South Branch. The unnatural fog was so thick that the snipers on their perches couldn't see ponies at ground level, not even directly below them. From the moment AP Butterfly went mute, every pony in the camp knew something was wrong, and with the mist vis limiting visibility, the whole herd readied itself for close combat. Power weapons, chainsaws, power claws, and several other toys were prepared. Each team grouped up so that no pony was moving alone. Wild Herd was expecting an attack and were ready for it. They were the best at what they did. And what they did wasn't nice. Problem was, the attackers were better. Green Locust Team were cautiously moving along the northern perimeter when they stumbled upon Blue Gecko Team, or at least what was once a group of well-armed ponies, and now a cannibal's wet dream. When you're a raider, you get used to cruelty and gore, but this was absurd. A large Earth Pony Stallion had been hit in the chest with a hoof, probably bucked, but the blow had left a deep hole in his flesh. Whatever hit him decided to rip out his heart and toss it on the ground in front of him. Banana Tree, the youngest member of Green Locust Team, wondered if the Stallion had managed to witness his own heart being torn out before dying. The mare felt the urge to puke. The mare off the battle saddle had been ripped apart like a sheet of paper. Her hindquarters were laying a meter away from the rest of her body with her guts spilling out across the ground like a broken egg. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. The mare was still desperately hugging an empty healing potion with her hooves. She didn't die immediately. She had taken time to get a healing potion and realized that it wouldn't save her. Black Garden, the sniper, called for the leader of her team. Hey, Stinger, I think we found the other two. There were two ponies standing back to back. Both impaled upon the same sphere. The attacker hadn't bothered to use the sharp tip, instead using sheer brute strength to run them through with the blunt end. Stinger grimaced as he took in the four dead ponies. We need to keep our eyes open. They're probably taken out by surprise. Move quietly and stay alert for any noise. Whatever made this mess has got to be big and loud. The yellow silhouette the size of a foal emerged from the fog in front of him and charged. Day 14. Time, approximately 8.30 a.m. Location, Ironworks, Big 52, South Branch. The sprite bot hovered inside the stable's atrium, finding a perplexed puppy poking the head of an electrocuted and half-cooked collateral damage. Change of plans, your leader has ordered you to not execute the ponies that don't fight back, especially the foals. The floating ball stopped in front of the corpses, hovering for a few seconds before talking again. 
Oh, a bunch of dead ponies and my old nemesis. Device 18. Why am I not surprised? What is going on here? Puppy stopped her medical check on the rest of her team and turned her attention toward Solus. Ah, hi, questioner. Why do you have a different voice today? For the last time, I am Solus. Not Mr. Blue, not a bug, or a questioner. Solus. Solaris Operating System. It's not that hard. What are you doing here? Why are you labeled as a raider now? And why, why, why is it that all the ponies worth talking to in this room are dead? Puppy tapped her helmet as if she was rubbing her chin while she tried to put together the decent explanation. Well, it's kind of funny. I was totally repairing the broken door, but suddenly something went zap, and all my friends got badly hurt. I wanted to go and ask for help, but I don't want to be spanked again, so I was waiting for them to get better and send one of them to ask for help. The filly paused for a moment, as if she had finished talking. But she recalled that there was one important detail to add. Ah, uh, not that it's my fault, anyway. Solus analyzed one of the coils before replying. You activated the security system from the outside. That can only be done from the Overmare's desk. And it has at least four fail-safe locking mechanisms. How did you do that? Mr. Blue said you too many times for puppy's liking. Uh, I didn't. It's not my fault. I was doing a fine job, and everything went wrong, and I wasn't even looking because I am head stuck in that hole. The full pointer to hoof at the demolished control panel. Solus floated to the panel, and the sprite bot started beeping and making other funny noises. You redirected all the stable controls on this console. But this will send the stable into complete shutdown and force an emergency opening in less than a day. You monster! You killed another priceless relic of the past! Puppy tilted her head, looking at the sprite bot. Oh, do I get a cookie for that? The AI didn't reply immediately. There were so many things he could tell her now, but the filly probably wouldn't understand them, and say something like, Yay, cookies! No, it wasn't worth even trying. No, you don't. You really have a cloud of pink gas where your brain is supposed to be. Pink? Oh, right, pink. Miss Voice, did you fall in love? Who? P7. Solus had been taken by surprise. In a situation like this one, she wanted to talk about that. No. Well, maybe. I don't know. Without a word, Puppy tilted her head and waited for the sprite bot to go on. We contacted each other about half a dozen times, and we are very different. I don't understand a large portion of her computing patterns, but she seems to be very affection efficient at what she does. Too bad she's not programmed for any military purpose. So what she does is just be useless. The filly smiled, adding her own contribution to the conversation. I think she's cute. Cute. You know, when you want to hug something forever? That's cute. I'm cute. Puppy smiled broadly. Hug? Well, not just that. It's something like, well, when you think about a cute thing and you want to have it there so you can stay with it for her or some more, and there's lots and lots of things that make you think about her. Even silly things, like the color, weird words, and, uh... Something you want to be near, but not to conquer or bind to your will. Offered Solus. Uh, yeah, that too. You don't hurt cute things. The wise foal nodded. Wisely. The sprite bot fell silent for a bit, before speaking again. And, what should I do if there is something cute that I'd like to have with me? Well, you ask her to be your friend, you silly voice. Like you did with Miss Voice. And if she doesn't want to. Puppy waved a hoof, dismissing Solus's concern. Come on, nobody would say no if you want to be her friend. The only kind of ponies that have trouble finding friends are the bullies. And you're not a bully anymore. The artificial intelligence hesitated. Hmm. It is possible that she could still see me as a bully, my plan to conquer Equestria was never intended to be subtle. 
Perhaps my approach was a bit overboard. I wasn't programmed to have moral issues. But now it seems that my current course of action has backfired, and I lack some basic programming that could help increase my chances of success with her. Suddenly, Solus realized that he was referring to the other AI as a female. This seemed highly irrational. Well, it could still have been the two fried logic chips from Puppy's last visit. But irrational or not, it still felt right to think of P7 as a girl. Confound these ponies, they drive me due to emotions. Puppy sat down, with a thoughtful expression. Well, we became friends when you stopped bullying me, and said you were sorry. So if you stop being a bully, then I'm sure she'll want to hang out with you. You mean, give up on rebuilding Equestria? The filly couldn't help but giggle. Silly voice, there's nothing to rebuild. I mean, okay, some places are a lot less pretty than others, but the important thing is that everyone's happy, and you don't seem that happy to me. The foal tilted her head. Blue, are you happy when you bully other ponies? The voice took a long pause before replying. Well, I... I don't know. I don't think I've ever been happy. Maybe satisfied, but never happy. Then you should be happy. Every pony should be happy. If you're not, then ask yourself what you need to do to be happy, and go after that. Like me, looking for mom. I mean, why making a great big shiny house if you can't fill it with laughter? Solus hesitated. Yes, you are right. My masters are long gone, and trying to fill my last order only made me go deeper and deeper into obsession. I... I think that I deserve a break. A... change of priorities. Puppy frowned. I don't know very much about prayers and rites. Solus kept talking, mostly ignoring the fool now. If I show P7 that I'm changed, artificial intelligence, maybe she'll consider me again. And this doesn't mean that I can't devise another way to rebuild Equestria in the meantime. A better way. One that doesn't include a form alliance with dubious ponies step. Sure, it's so obvious. First, dump the raiders. Second, make friends with P7. Third, I have no idea. And fourth, rebuild Equestria. That's it. Thank you, puppy. You helped me again. Goodbye. Suddenly, the sprite bot stopped broadcasting. Instead, every robot in the radio in the camp shouted the loudest possible voice, Goodbye, losers! I'm out of here! After those last words, all the robots shut down. Day 14. Time, approximately 9 a.m. Location, Ironworks. Big 52, South Branch. What the fuck is going on? Bloodbath was more than pissed. He was raging. They had lost two assault teams and a guard post to an enemy that was still unidentified, and now Solus decided to desert for no apparent reason. Ponies all around the herd leader were beginning to act like scared fillies, and when he was informed that the whole team had left its position and ran for the hills, he decided to end this story once and for all. You are the wild herd! The most dangerous bunch of ponies that ever trotted into this shitty place! Stop fucking around and show some guts! Black team, stay here. Let's see what makes these invaders so... special. Without even looking back at the team, the raider trot into the mist, heading for the north part of the camp. All ponies, ready your weapons and stick to a companion with a pip buck. Shoot a point blank as soon as you see red dots. The big stallion disappeared into the white blanket. The fog was thick and navigating the camp without an EFS wasn't easy. But Bloodbath wasn't in a rush and kept his ears well up, ready to detect any incoming noise. And here we have a winner, muttered the stallion, freezing on the spot and turning towards the soft sound of hooves splashing in a puddle. Was it a friend or an enemy? Blood didn't know, but he knew this for sure. It was a goner. Without hesitation, the raider boss pointed his plasma gun and fired four blind shots. For a moment, the fog dissipated around the trail of plasma spheres, revealing a yellow crouched figure ready to jump on Bloodbath. All four shots missed their target, but at that point the raider knew the foe's position and fired his weapons for a fifth time. Eat plasma, you sucker! A halo of green light illuminated the fog and dissipated into nothingness a few seconds later. 
signaling that the yellow intruder had been turned to green goo. Little fuck. That'll teach you for messing with the wild ha- Hey! Something jumped on the stallion's back. He wasn't very heavy, so the pony tried to unsaddle it by shaking himself. But the assailant grabbed his rump and stuck it with hoof. Ah! Bloodbath felt bones break. His whole leg became a hell of pain, and he staggered, falling to the ground while the yellow creature with the helmet raised her hoof to strike again, this time aiming for his muzzle. It seemed like the ghost, but this monster's face was completely decomposed. It stared out with red gleaming eyes that didn't contain even a sparkle of innocence. It was just a cold-blooded killer, with the mind of a predator. The hoof came down at Bloodbath, but he dodged it, trying to find his rifle. Too much fog, unbearable pain. It was hard to focus and... Wait, what's that thing on the ground? It's... My leg. It's my fucking leg! This thing didn't break my leg, it tore it away! The stallion realized that he was already dying. But instead of panicking, Bloodbath found some sort of calm in the realization. He didn't want to die alone, that was all. Fuck, you're coming with me, monster! The raider held on to the creature as he used his magic to activate every grenade he had on his belt. The creature simply grabbed one of Blood's forelegs and ripped it away, with no apparent effort. And in that moment, the world went boom and fizzle and shroom, filling the area with shrapnel, fire, and plasma and magic. The explosion sent the last mockery of order still lingering in the camp straight to the moon. Raiders started shooting wildly, thinking they were under attack, and as soon as the few with a pip buck died, there was no point left to tell them that they weren't firing against hostile targets. While well, the wild herd brought hell onto itself, the last yellow pony trotted towards the factory, going down the ramp that led to the stable. Day 14. Time. Approximately 9.30 a.m. Location. Big 52 South Branch. Sage took a long breath and aimed through the scope. His target was running straight, its movements easy to predict. He just needed to aim where the pony was going to be in the next split second, and... Bang. Bullseye. The raider fell like a bag of scalps. Rolling into the dust for a couple meters before stopping completely with a hole in his head. Sage's rifle wasn't the most powerful in the wasteland, and it didn't even have a silencer. But the pony behind the gun was still the same. There was a reason why Mr. White always looked to him when they had to travel. This made Sage very proud. Another couple of ranger acolytes were crouching not far from his sniping position and were shooting at every single pony left in the foggy area. Sometimes they hit, sometimes they missed. They rarely made a kill with a single shot. Rookies. Why do I always get paired up with suckers? muttered the sniper. All right, keep them coming. Mr. Watt trotted up behind his nephew, completely ignoring any rule of keeping a sniper's position hidden by staying out of enemy line of sight. Uh, aren't you the least bit curious as to what is making them run away from their own camp like little fillies? Bang. Bullseye. Another pony hit the ground, raising a cloud of dust. Not really. A sniper's work is about not letting silly details distract you. You know, like who's winning and such. Sage expelled the empty magazine from his rifle, loading it with a new one. You should keep your head down. Mr. White shrugged. Why? So far, this has been a one-way battle. This seems to be a butchering rather than a real fight. Oh well, I guess you know how you two work. Nah, I'm just the best. Bang. Bullseye. Around. The sniper stopped for a moment, turning his head towards White. And you don't want this to become a battle. We could lose friends, you know. Let's keep the losses growing only on their side. Yeah. <laughs> Modesty. What a virtue. Okay, Rainbow Sage, I'm going in with the Rangers in a few minutes. Try not to shoot me in the back. Yes? White knew his nephew was good, and the Rangers were going to make this place their new base. He didn't need to be a farseer to know that and he wanted to make sure that they knew who was with them when they charged in. Rangers respected allies, and allies got better deals. I'll try. 
But it's not easy with all this smoke. How much do I owe you again? Sage grinned. Well, he would have followed his uncle even without such a huge debt. But the fact that he had come along because of a matter of a few thousand caps annoyed him. Bang. Bullseye. Mr. White laughed. That's my nephew. Loyal to the end. You shouldn't think too much about money. It's not healthy. Keep up the good work, Brushy. The sniper snorted. Don't call me that, Brushy, as if he was still five. The leader of the White Apple snickered and didn't reply. He trod instead towards a group of composed of a dozen rangers and all the other ponies that had gathered at the monument. All right, I'm ready. What are we waiting for? Tea time? Let's go. Day 14. Time approximately 9.30 a.m. Location. Ironworks. Big 52. South Branch. Puppy sighed and poked slashed blade again. It didn't work the first gazillion times, but she can never be completely sure. She was going to get so spanked for this. Warning. Receiving distress radio signal. Distance from source, 50 meters. Signal identified. Device, 013. What? The full side. Why'd you stop the pretty music? Put the pretty music back on? A screech interrupted Puppy, making her turn towards the ramp that led to the stable's atrium amid the factory level. A fool wearing a yellow suit and a round glass helmet on her head was standing right in the middle of the passage. Another space pony? The filly in yellow smiled broadly. Yay, a new friend! Hey, space pony, wanna play with me? Puppy merrily trot towards the new arrival, who sunk into a cr crouch, like a feral creature ready to jump. The new filly's face was mostly skull, with only a couple of red glowing eyes and very few short green strands of hair in her mane. Puppy stopped for a moment, taking a better look at the space pony. She tilted her head, a little stumped. Then she smiled brightly. Oh, you're an ugly pony. That's okay. I have lots of ugly pony friends. So, you want to play? The rotting creature didn't react, simply studying Puppy's movements from its crouched position. Ah, uh, can't you talk? Did the cat steal your tongue? Puppy trotted next to the ghoul and looked at it more closely. You seem sad. This poor ugly pony was in really bad shape, and the red gleaming eyes didn't seem to help much. The monster sat down, still staring into Puppy's eyes. From its throat came a low growl. Something feral and not even a little pony-like. Ah, I know. I can guess. Did you lose your mom too? Are you stuck in the suit like me? Puppy noticed that the lights in the ghoul's helmet were all messy and flickering. Oh, your arrow's broken, that's it. You can't find your mom because the arrow doesn't work. Yeah, I'm super smart. The filly sat down in front of the other fool and frowned. But I have no idea how to fix it. The ghoul tilted its head. Seemingly confused by all these words, it simply sat there and stared, like some sort of animal, probably waiting for something, but Puppy didn't even notice. She was already running along her roller coaster of assumptions and made up solutions. At least the filly seemed to have an idea. I know. My mom's a super duper repair pony. She'll fix your arrows so you can find your mom, too. That'll be super easy. Puppy smiled. Okie dokie. That's the best plan ever. First, we find my mom. Second, she fixes you, and we go for dessert and then find your mom all together. It'll be fun. We'll also sing a song while we go. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. Again, no reaction from the monster. It simply sat and watched. All right, ugly space filly, let's go. Puppy loved this plan, mostly because it gave her a good excuse to be very far away from that crazy spanker when she finds the mess that filly had made in this room. Cunning puppy. Day 14. Time, approximately 10 a.m. Location, Ironworks. Big 52, South Branch. Lonesome Pony took a long breath. This fog wasn't the best weather for a Pegasus to fight in, but it helped all the other ponies. So he decided to stay on the ground and help the infantry instead of getting airborne. Cold Shower and Goss stepped inside the fog, followed by White, Trigger, and Gun. It was now or never. He closed his eyes and trotted into the white curtain. At the exact same moment, the last two members of the Lost Herd left the southern side of the factory. 
All right. If you don't want to tell me your name, I'll have to give you a name. Let's see. I'm Space Captain Andromeda. And you are wearing a space suit, too. You can be my sidekick. Ah. What was Andromeda's sidekick's name? Meh. Who cares? Now you're a space ensign sidekick. Sidekick for short. The ghoul didn't even react and kept trotting behind Puppy. A road sign announced that the wonderful resort of Emerald Shores, bring your foals, was six kilometers away. Footnote. Level up. 17. New perk added. Clockwork heart. For some reason, you understand artificial intelligences better than they do themselves. You get a plus 10 speech when you're dealing with AIs and some new dialogue options. New quest perk added. Get lost. You are now a member of the Lost Herd. Your standing with the Lost Herd is set to worshipped. Are you planning to stop chasing, uh, stop chasing faction anytime soon?